good afternoon once good again afternoon. to everyone. Are you here? Uh, a well, we have come to the last session, and it's a pleasure for me to be the moderator of a panel with this level of uh, members here, of experts. And we left this um, topic of financing to the end um, of our event because we understand that it is uh, essential to think about, at the end of the day, who's going to pay the bill or who's going to help pay the bill. So, uh, we have the program, but I will call I imagine you have the program, but um, Mr. Haytham, it's a pleasure to have you here. Natalia, Lessa, Otaviano, and Armando. The topic that we're going to dis be discussing now seems like a very simple topic to these specialists that we have here. But for myself and for many of those who are here, it's a more difficult subject. So I'm going to ask my colleagues here um, use more simple um, terms. Uh, so that we are able to understand this in layman's terms. But at the same time, it's a sophisticated topic. And I'd like to start out with a question to you, Lessa. Um, so I know that you are a champion of the Banco da Amazonia. So how does the Banco da Amazonia um, work in developing um, the Amazon region and uh, therefore impact the rest of the country here in Brazil? And how can this be a reference for the African continent? So I'm going to, since we have many panelists here, I'm going to ask you to take around two minutes in your answers. Well, uh, good afternoon to uh, all of you, my fellow panelists and Bosco here, and um, this select audience. Well, Banco da Amazonia has been in the Amazon for 82 years. Um, doing uh, the work of sustainable development in the Amazon region. And when we look at the Amazon region, uh, I think somebody mentioned this, I, maybe Maria Teresa, we have some complex issues because most of the people in the world, this doesn't only happen in Brazil, but uh, most people think that the Amazon is just the force. But according to the IBG, our census, we have around 20 million people living there. And these people live there and they live um, and get their sustenance from the Amazon. And they are original, indigenous to the Amazon area. And we think, when we think of development with sustainability, we have to have two things that are compatible. The um, environmental protection, which we can't give up at all. And uh, the, our bank has a very strict credit policy. Um, those who are familiar with the FEBRABAN, the Brazilian um, Bank Association, we have uh, the requirement of sustainability sustainability for credit that is given, and we have 53 sustainable um, elements, items, and uh, credit environmental risk that are considered. And we do this because we believe that credit is the way to make a change in people's lifestyle feasible. So we want to take investments and uh, investment to cities and communities that have a low human development rate. So when we think about the state of Amazonas and Amapá that have more than 90% of the vegetation preserved, 70% of the people who live there live beneath the poverty line. They have a very low human development um, percentage. So how can we make the investments and the businesses that we take there be compatible um, with these goals and uh, generate jobs or maybe give technical assistance to the small farmers, to the small businesses, so they can develop those businesses there. So just to uh, sum up my word, when thinking about the forum and how to make this connection between Brazil and African countries, when we look at the two major tropical forests in the world, we look at Brazil and Africa. When we think about the 
Human Development Index uh, in Brazil and African countries, they are very similar. When we look at our Amazon forest and we see that in our forest there are many needs and different characteristics, whether they are related to the culture or the social development that require specific policies, and there's no silver bullet to solve the problems in the Amazon. It's the same thing when we look at the tropical forests in Africa, many different countries with different needs. So I believe that the main point for this discussion is there is no silver bullet, no magic formula. So I'm very happy to be a part of this event because we live in the Amazon. We have those specific um, characteristics. We know what works, what doesn't work. And I believe that we can share this with our friends in Africa who also are aware of the problems they face, the challenges, what's worked in the past, what hasn't worked. And so I hope that at the end we are able to find solutions that will improve people's lives and preserve the environment. And that way we'll be, we'll be able to have truly sustainable development in the two major tropical forests in the world. Brazil and Africa, and I know that you have a good experience in Brazil uh, because you spent some of your time in Brazil, more than four or five years, um, when you lead a very important initiative. Uh, but if you compare the two regions, Brazil as a, as a country, as a continent almost, and, and, and uh, Africa in, in, in general, but some countries in particular, like uh, Ethiopia, how do you finance uh, 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 infrastructure to reach remote areas. Because when you look to urban areas like Sao Paulo, it's important, it's easy to see development. But what about remote areas? How can you uh, go straight to these places? Um, first and foremost, uh, Raul, as always, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be back here in Sao Paulo. As you said, I've, I've lived here for a number of years, many, many years ago, and I like to believe I know Brazil a little bit, and specifically to answer your question, and, it, and I come from the private side, okay? I'm not a, we're not a development institute. We are a private equity fund. We're a Washington-based investment bank, but much of our work is in emerging markets, in particular in Africa, and um, a lot of the work we're also involved in requires the partnerships with DFIs, Development Financial Institutions. So um, take, for example, uh, a, a simple case of building a road connecting one part of a country to another, especially in Africa. Uh, the private sector by itself uh, would not be willing to do it, right? Especially even if it's a toll road. However, if the DFIs and governments de-risk it. So in other words, they take the first tranche. Uh, because these, these deals, even in urban areas, by the way, Joao, you'll be surprised to, uh, to hear this, it's not always easy to find financing for infrastructure projects, even in big cities in Africa, right? So not just the rural areas. I think you were focused more on the rural areas, but I, I think I want to expand the discussion saying, broader infrastructure investment. So the, the first and most important thing is DFIs and governments through what we call PPP, public-private partnerships, can help pull in private capital if they're willing to de-risk it by coming in on the first tranche before private capital kicks in. I think that's, that's the way we, we operate, that's the way we, we recommend. And also beyond um, the, the financing side of it, the reason we want governments to come in on these initiatives is because they have the ability, they have the power to streamline the bureaucracies that could delay you, that could delay projects, right? So if you bring in governments through a public private partnership arrangement, if you bring in the DFIs, it, it could even be Brazil DFIs, okay, Brazilian DFIs, so the African Development Bank, the African Export, the Exporting Bond Bank, all these other institutions, the World Bank, uh, I think there's Plenty of capital, and this is the, the surprising part of it, is where, where we work, we, we're based in the US, so there's no shortage of capital in America. But the question is, how do you present it to people who control the capital to understand that the risk that they perceive, or the real or the perceived risk, can be de-risked, and the way to do it is having these three-layered partnerships. 
state, DFIs, and private capital. Then there's going to be a lot of capital that comes in. But so this is sort of uh, as an initial comment, uh, my, my key recommendation would be to have to create this kind of partnerships so that the trillions that are certainly in the US, the trillions of dollars that are just sitting in low interest accounts or earning single digit IRRs can come to places, specifically in our case in Africa, and be deployed to transform and address the infrastructure, the huge infrastructural needs that the continent has. And then maybe later on in the discussions, I can add a few other comments. All right, thank you for your recommendation. I think we can take this as a direction. Uh, Otaviano. Uh, Otaviano, you me they mentioned PPP and private capital, and you have had many different hats, and you have some, but try to explain to us what is the role of the private sector in financing infrastructure, because usually we think that infrastructure or the financing of infrastructure is only in the hands of the states of the public banks, and the capacity of financing is not real. We need to look for some capacities. Can the private sector help, and how? Yeah, certainly they can help. It's a pleasure and honor to be here with you at this panel. In my experience for years as the Vice President of the Inter-American Bank of Development and then at the World Bank. And in the World Bank, I was also a member of a steering uh, committee. I saw an evolution in the relation between institution financing, governments, and private sector that somehow illustrate as João Bosco is mentioning, which is to be realistic, the needs of investments and infrastructure faced by the world in development are huge, not only because of the goals of sustainable development, but because of the climate change, even in terms of the adaptation not to mention the mitigation of climate change, but this huge magnitude of investments that are necessary. I will not mention the statistics, but look at the projections of the group of experts of G20 that presented estimations or estimations made by the World Bank or by uh, uh, the ECL. They are huge. And on the one hand, they are they don't have fiscal space all over the world in development, not to mention the cases where we have unsustainable debt that involves some kind of restructure in the near future. So I cannot imagine that those needs of investments can be met only by states, too, with no exception. Two. Multilateral institutions are limited. Haitam observed how a financial management of those institutions, where I was the vice president, many times it's so conservative that they keep the reason between capital and, and assets that is so tight, 20%, and not by chance, G20 and the group of experts recommended that those institutions consider to reduce this proportion, active uh, assets and capital, in order to find more room for financing. The World Bank has announced that they will do that, but the space to be Got with that, it is not that big. World Bank will create a space of more financing of $50 billion in 10 years, lowering in 20 from 20 to 19 percent the assets capital reason. So, even though there is an increase of capital in those institutions, I was, I took part 
as a member of the steering committee of the last increase of capital on the World Bank that was approved in 2018. And I can tell all the space created with increase of capital in 2018 was already used. It's gone with the pandemic. So there's a huge need of more capital. It's not an easy task. There's complicated gover governance issues of sharing uh, goes among the shareholders, so international financial institutions are still limited. So having the private sector is key if we want to really have a ramping up of the investments in infrastructure now. The evolution that I was mentioning is that those institutions clearly understood that the most productive things for them to do was not to focus on doing that investment that the private sector can do more easily. But it is somehow multilateral financial institutions as well as regionals, as well as national development banks, they should focus on looking at the value chain of infrastructure projects and detect in those chains of infrastructure projects which are the points, the areas, the types of risks which management is harder for the private sector. Such as water, energy, uh, highways, each of those infrastructure areas has different risks associated and different types of intermediates. We have what the bank does better, we have what funds does do better, and so forth. And the best thing to do by a development institution is to focus on the more complicated risks and provide financing for those points in this chain. By doing that, that becomes feasible to incorporate the private investments. This is uh, the crowding for private sector rather than cry, crowd out of the private sector. This is the, the most profitable guideline and shall be observed not only by multilateral institutions, but also by national development banks. We'll soon go back to this point. Heighten. represent a bank that covers the whole continent, Afrexin Bank. Uh, uh, Otaviano mentioned that we should see what areas, sanitation, power, and, and so on. Uh, from your perspective, I know the, the bank, although Afrex Bank is a, has a very big check to distribute uh, among uh, the, the partners, but what, what area Afrex Bank uh, wants to, to, to approach, but, but also how possible is for the private sector, including Brazilian private, private sector, to take advantage of the policy of the bank? Okay, thank you. Good point. So let me link this to what we heard in the previous panel on the Global South. And, and from this, we'll take how the Global South. So the Global South will not happen easily if we don't get our finance right and our directs right. If we don't get the money right, Global South is a big dream. The issue that we have on the Global South is if you look at the country ratings on the Global South, it's definitely much lower than, if I can call them, the Global North. What does it mean for us dreaming of connecting continents? Our cost of fund, cost of projects, cost of de-risk is higher. The same project is happening on the north is much cheaper than it happens here, affecting margins, affecting cost of living, affecting everything. So we need to get this right, and we need to get our finance right. We need to strengthen our regional banks, our multilaterals, to carry the load with the international institution because they look at our risk differently. 
So if I link this to your question on where to focus, uh, let me analyze it in a general terms. We discussed in the morning in the speech just specific areas, but let me get the, the criteria that we might need to think of. Most of the global south look at Africa. They depend a lot on raw material for their daily expenses. And if you look at the China-Japan example where they use their uh, resources to develop capital for development, this is what we're trying to help countries do. Areas like raw material, converting it to funds and capital to inject into project, very critical. But also we need to be very selective when it looks like what raw material shall we trade. Some raw material, they are not feasible for countries to just add value, like we said. Some of them is better to export to gain capital, and some of them will add value. And typically, countries in their developing stage, they need to choose projects where they're high labor, low capital, versus high capital, low labor, because we have a lot of labor to employ. We need to go into this capital and so on. So as I see now connecting Brazil and, and Africa, for example, there's a lot of experience that can be shared. We talked about the health area. There's a lot of demand gap in pharmaceutical and health. How can they share, set up shop? And this is, as a development bank, what we do typically, one, is support them directly, and second, we invite them to our industry zones where we give them all the protection, all the support to set up shop and deal within the free trade area. There's a lot of work that we can do in agriculture. Almost 90% of agriculture happening in Africa are happening through rain, not through irrigation, organized irrigation. A lot of experience can be done through this. A lot of capacity building with the knowledge here being transferred to the other side. There's a large number of those areas that can be done. The whole idea is that finance, risking, whatever the idea is, has to be sorted. You, it's not about just the idea, it's about getting the people to rally, engaging government, engaging multilaterals, engaging multilaterals to the right way that will encourage even private banks and private sector to take part. It's, it's, it's an equation of not just science and knowledge, it's science and knowledge and, and finance. So different areas, as we mentioned today in the morning, but the main thing is how to fix it, how can we rally things. So we see a lot of our projects where we bring investment and trade from Brazil, for example, here into Africa, where we interfere rallying out other banks, bringing more capital to the table and, and take it from there. So the areas are much. I think we have to do a lot. The percentage that we see is 1% of Africa trade is represented of the Brazil portion. I think Brazil deserves much more portion on Brazil-Africa corridor than what we have now. So let's sort our finance and risking pricing right, and I think everything will flow from there. Well, obrigado uh, pela, pela explicação. Nós vamos, we come back to this, this point uh, soon. Natalia, Natalia session, yesterday we had a session about AI. And it seems that the session was talking about uh, women empowerment, and we had more women here at the session rather than men. And I know this is a topic that is important for you. There's another topic that is sustainability and the creation of jobs. If we think about that, if we don't think about that, it's hard to have infrastructure. We have to think about capacity building of people, otherwise we will not move forward in simple terms. And in your past activities, you mentioned this. I'd like to ask you, how can we think about infrastructure not investing in human capacity building, or how can we increase the capacity of countries to self-manage or to have more development with the capacity building of people? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Congratulations, João, for Brazil Africa Forum. It's so special for us bring those two regions closer. Let me step back and use a little bit of my recent experience working in the National Development Bank. And I was running a South African bank here in Brazil, and I worked with Brazil and Africa. 
So I think two, the two re regions have more similarities than we can think of, both Brazil and the continent, and African continent. And I know each country has different specificities, but they really need to move forward in investments, diversify their economies, and we still have the context that is more exacerbated with the need of energy transition, given the context we have in terms of the fiscal capacity of the government to have to, to self-finance themselves and the subsidizes coming from the North Global, so the Global North. So the uh, role of development banks and the financial market is very important. So I'd like to echo, to resonate with Otaviano's comments in the sense of what is the role that public banks at national level which are those who have the vision of public policy. They know how to structure projects, and they are at the end to really make this, to make things happen. <clears throat> We've been discussing the multilateral banks' role, but public banks also, they can make investments in the private sector feasible, but also prepare projects to be more financiable by the several players we have. So in the sense, I think there is something that is missing in this uh, question, which is how can we make that the national savings and the capital that is within the countries can be directed to finance infrastructure? And this, there's the role that we have to mention in order to reduce the cost of capital, which is the develop the local capital market where we would really bringing savings of the pensions, funds, foundations, and the savings would be used in those projects where we can really foster inclusion and promote economic development. So that's what the Brazilian government is trying to do. And that's what the African continent, and maybe this is not good news for the relationships between Brazil and Africa, and somehow in the energy transition, Brazil and Africa would be competitors because of the scarcity of resources at, uh, at, at global level. So we have to move from, glo from billions to trillions to finance transition. Many estimations of the f uh, um, the financing of the climate uh, change adaptation and things are the 3.3 billions, and only 15% of that is being used. So the figures are huge, and they have to reach to 8.5 trillions of per year. But we think about the stock of wealth, where we have more than 150 billions in liquidity. The world was never so liquid. Or if you think about the percentage of global GDP, it is not so much. So I think we can make it feasible if we address within the countries the regulation and we have to have legal stability and assess regulation and review the role of banks to make the banks that reduce risk to have the crowd in. So capacity building is important. There is no de sustainable development possible without the inclusion of the majority of the population. And we are talking about not only women, but other minorities. In Brazil, we have an, an issue of ethic, eth ethical, racial uh, diversity, and we cannot promote this kind of development without capacity building and capital. So this is the role that the governments have to invest and the companies as well to prepare their labor for the uh, transition to the future. That's what we really, that's why we have to have policies to move forward in this topic. Well, um, maybe we could even have a forum just with this topic. It's uh, very important. Uh, Armando, many times we look to a country and we see the vocation for that country for attracting investment or for attracting uh, foreign interests. I remember um, a conversation that I had recently in Angola with one of the authorities there, and he was telling me that in the 70s and 80s, Angola was in among the top 
for coffee producers worldwide. And today, Angola is no longer ranked as an important country in coffee production. In, and other types of crops were lost also. So how can countries, not necessarily Angola, I just gave it as an example, but how can countries get away from being, you know, tied to just one type of crop or commodity and to have that development? Thank you very much for the invitation to participate in such an important panel with my distinguished colleagues. Well, um, I'm going to talk about the countries in the African continent. The countries that depend on monocultures for exporting and the available of these commodities internationally. Um, and this happens because m many of these economies were designed to extract or exploit raw materials and to export there. Um, and then in the 60s, we had the um, started uh, civil wars, and then we had the Cold War. Africa was at the center of the Cold War, and so c many civil conflicts were born at uh, that moment that destroyed the economies of the countries in Africa, such as was the case in Angola. And then we have the challenge in the absence of human capital. Many people were killed, many people migrated, and then these economies had the need to diversify. So I'm here as the chairman of the Sovereign Fund, so obviously um, I have a public uh, resume and CV. I went to the World Bank. Um, today we're talking about the, from the perspective of an investment fund. So what did we see in Africa over the last few decades, especially with the um, fall downfall of um, global prices? The country started to create sovereign funds. Today, we have something like 30 sovereign funds in Africa. And these sovereign funds have a variety of purposes. Um, in the first generation, all were focused on fiscal um, stability and to try to soften the fall in exports and income. Today, we're in the third generation of these sovereign funds where we have seen various mutations. And today, many countries are creating sovereign funds that focus on development and funds for savings, peer savings. Um, for, for those who re remember your economy classes with the Keynesian um, principles, we have um, that you know about what we learned about investments. So even though the funds that are focused on pure savings, which is the type of fund that I manage, we assume that the savings will be uh, will be turned into investment. And we have a very diverse global economy. So we have um, the liquidity and the more advanced economy. But today we've started to reflect what are the drivers of the global economy. It's the emergent economy. So why not diversify our portfolios also for some emerging economies, for new classes of assets and commodities where infrastructure projects come in, basic infrastructure, infrastructure focused on agriculture. So it's very surprising for the reality in Africa. What has the empirical, uh, ha what have empirical studies shown? That the sovereign her funds with 300 billion in assets, um, the main commodity is agriculture and processing. Africa now has 1.4 billion in population in by 2050, um, the population will double. We have the highest fertility rate in the world. We have um, around 50 to 60 percent of the population under the age of 30, the largest workforce in the world. And our, with the free trade zone, we have uh, we will have a huge area of trade, and the countries are 
um, concerned about investing in human capital. And in doing that, you're looking at the Maslow at Maslow's pyramid, the few the main needs, which is food and security. So we are focused very strongly on agriculture. And so for the people who are here participating, looking at uh, from a global south perspective, we have these advantages, looking at which advantages Brazil has that they could share with uh, African countries. So agriculture is one of these areas. So our in financial institutions need to be able to work together and cooperate together to attract financial investment from uh, abroad. We are an investment to de-risk the investment, whether it's somebody who wants to invest in Brazilian agriculture um, and take it to Africa. We can take our equity into and add it to these projects, another bank to have a guarantee to um, keep the portfolio um, protected from the exchange volatility. So this is um, how the countries in the global south could cooperate. OK, uh, very good. I will come back in a moment to how countries or how businesses or individuals can be attracted to invest in our countries. So um, I was thinking here of a question for all of you. So I'm going to um, take the liberty here as the moderator um, to pose this question. I ask, ask you, um, uh, Zem, this is the same quest I will make for everybody, to everybody. Agriculture is the agenda, right? In Africa, in Brazil, in the world. Uh, how do we finance agriculture? Not, on, not only in Africa, in Brazil as well, uh, to, to develop the, the regions. But how can we add value to the production of agriculture? Look into agriculture as a a, a, a path for development. Right. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked me this question. You have two minutes to answer, please. I have two minutes. So I, I turn on my clock, huh? Okay. Um, no, I won't take long. But listen, this is a fantastic question. The reason I, I say that is, as you are aware, we just launched a new initiative here in Sao Paulo a couple nights ago, uh, which is a uh, $500 million agriculture-focused private equity fund. As you know, Brazil is a powerhouse in agriculture. Its, it's brand is beyond you know, question. In fact, it dominates a lot of uh, agriculture-focused activities around the world. So what we decided to do through private initiatives, uh, one of the big Brazilian private equity funds uh, decided to launch this fund in partnership with our firm and the idea will be bringing in Brazilian knowledge, know-how, expertise, and most importantly, capital to Africa. But it's, it's a two-way street. So because you asked me, you know, Afri Afri agriculture is a priority. How do, we, how do we leverage the resources that is in Africa? I think many of you have heard this data. 60% of the arable land in the world is in Africa today. But there's a, the flip side of it is Africa today imports between 40 and $50 billion of food every single year. It just defies logic. So we decided, and uh, Joao is also very much aware of this, that we need to do something as private sector to do something about it. And we've launched this, this fund, which will bring in, as a Brazilian expertise capital to Africa, but also for Africa, not only to feed, we call it the Global Food Security Fund One, is to address the food security needs not only of Africa, but also to export from Africa, okay? So that's one way I think we can show that the private sector is playing a very meaningful role addressing. Food is, you know, you all know that the Maslow's hierarchy of needs at the bottom is food, shelter, and clothing. That's as basic as it gets, but we are gonna go beyond that. In fact. Our, our tagline is from farm to fork, okay? Value addition is also a key component of it because Africa, the rap in Africa is we export only raw commodities and we're gonna turn that upside down. We're gonna be exporting from Africa 
with the Brazilian participation, value addition from coffee in Ethiopia to Brazilian beef exporters, companies coming and adding exports, even to the Middle East. You know, the very wealthy Gulf countries, they import virtually everything what they eat. So anyways, this is a no long-winded way, a very good example. I'm glad you asked me this question. I wasn't prepared for it, but it was, it was a good segue to, to, to conclude my, my comments. Thanks for respect, two minutes. Um, Lessa, agricultura... So, Lessa, agriculture is a reality for your region in the Amazon. How can we guarantee that agriculture becomes sexier, more attractive for investments, and how can we add value to what is produced in the region? Well, um, agriculture, the south of the Amazon region, is a, a belt of production. If you think about states like uh, Rondonia, Tocantins, and Maranhão, two minutes also. But I'd like to focus on three things. To make agriculture sexy, it needs to be profitable. And profitable, to make something profitable, it has to be sustainable. So when we look at the productive process in itself, we need technology, and we need to have the appropriate infrastructure for the outflow of what is produced. So this includes logistics, storage, transportation, whether it's by land or uh, water or rail. So we need to have um, ports also. This is what's going to create the appeal for the agriculture to be attractive. And this attraction can go uh, to a higher level. And um, besides having the adequate infrastructure, if we have the industrial capacity to add to the commodity. So exporting soybeans is one thing. Ex uh, exporting soy meal is another thing. So when we add, can add, we um, through our bank, we finance a project. Somebody mentioned here uh, that the cost of investing in the um, manufacturing plants, um, here we're talking about the Amazon specifically, and I imagine that it's the same thing in the African tropical forest. Um, I imagine that the cost there is larger than in developed uh, countries. So I imagine that that manufacturing plant will cost uh, uh, more than it would in an urban center. So we need to develop conditions so that we can be competitive in the production, uh, whether it's uh, in, in these agricultural um, products. So we need the appropriate investment in logistics and in infrastructure and above all, have a sustainable view to those projects they were investing in so that and to make sure that they aren't pressuring the environment or damaging the environment. So this investment is what's going to guarantee this development. Thank you very much. You said it all in two minutes. Now, Natalia, um, agriculture is something that we could talk about for days. And I know that in your work in a private bank and then a public bank, agriculture has always been at the center of the discussion. How can agriculture going from something that is just a discussion to being uh, part of the national um, policies? Well, uh, just to talk about the importance of the agriculture, um, it's 20% of the GDP in the and also of the jobs that are created. In the 10 years that I worked with Africa, agriculture is the area in which we have the most similarities between Brazil and the African continent. All of the technology developed in Brazil, which is a tropical climate, can be used also in uh, the sub-Saharan African countries. So we also have this um, scenario of climate change. So we can study how climate change affects agriculture and how can we um, develop practices that will help to capture carbon from the soil and how can we take these agricultural practices that are being developed in Brazil, like the integration of the forest, the cattle and the fields. Um, to Africa, the same way that Africa took longer to develop in the energy sector, and then they were able to um, skip a few steps in going from uh, using solar energy um, to advance quicker, um, I think 
especially the um, African agriculture, can also skip some stuff. You can have bio inputs, you can have the fixation of carbon, and have this integration between the forest, cattle, and fields, just to give a few examples. Armando, um, going back to you, we talked about agriculture, you talked about coffee. So how can you produce various crops and commodities at the same time to diversify a portfolio of a specific country? We talked about a single crop and commodity. How can we diversify that? Well, this is a strategy that has been uh, used in the, that we're looking for in the sovereign fund. We are um, focusing on animal protein at short term, so pork and poultry. When you talk about animal protein, then you're also talking about grains, vegetable protein. And so we are talking about sorghum, soy, corn, and um, sunflower seeds. So we want to, for example, um, to take the protein out of these um, plants to use for feed. So we want to invest in the whole chain, starting in the fields, in the processing units, part of the infrastructure and the storage, the um, until the, the whole chain. So we are looking at the cash crops. So these are specific classes where Africa has competitive advantage. So for example, um, the export of avocados um, or sugar cane, the production of sugar. Uh, we have the competitive advantage to um, prefer the, the palms also. Um, we have we approved a five-year strategy, and we understand that focusing on these segments, it is enough to have a significant impact in diversifying the economy. And let me add something else. Our strategy also looks at the whole value chain, where the fertilizer is a crucial, very important element. Um, we have some natural resources. Uh, we have the nitrogen products, use natural gas to turn it into ammonia and urea. So we are working with sulfates. But if we look at the blends also in a way that we gain the knowledge, and this is um, the importance of the multilateral organisms, we know that, um, that the development banks aren't only there to invest, but also to transfer knowledge. So so we need to study the soil, um, the geography of the country, and then let these blenders um, calibrate the fertilizer, something that Embrapa did very well here in Brazil in the past. And then finally, looking at the human capital, which is the greatest resource that the continent has. So we're looking at the pharmaceutical sector to develop um, pharmaceutical products and the raw materials that will help to, and medicine that will help the everyday ailments that the population has. Well, Armando, we are still talking about uh, agriculture. So how can we turn knowledge into wealth so that agriculture can become a very important asset for a country? Well, just with these two minutes, I'd like to um, point something out. Financing for agriculture is no longer a challenge when you are have the conditions to produce with profitability, with quality. So I think the issues, the problems, are not so much related to uh, capital or not having capital or investment. Why do I say this? When I first came to the World Bank, um, we conducted a survey about the Brazilian soy, because the Brazilian soy in 2004 was um, already uh, competing with the US in the production capacity and to the volume, and we wanted to learn with the Brazilian experience to take it to other countries. And why does this come to mind? Because the World Bank's report concluded that Brazil was at that position uh, in spite of, in spite of losing 30% of the soybean production 
because of the proper logistics and storage conditions. So just think, if Brazil had the proper logistics and storage capacity, the production could be much larger. So the problem was not in the investment. Um, it was in the lack of investment in complementary um, elements here. In 2006, there was a small piece of land here in Sao Paulo which produced sugarcane. And the owner of the farm was an engineer, and he showed us uh, on his laptop um, the map of 18 different types of sugarcane seeds that he had selected there from and uh, out of the 500 seeds that were available. So he used science. So the president of the World Bank turns and says to me, science. Yes, of course. The explanation of the Brazilian agricultural production comes from science. So obviously there is a very important role um, from the public investments in the beginning and obviously this is the a point that has hasn't been explored much so the transfer of technology between Brazil and Africa because uh, surely given the similarities of our soils with a few changes our portfolio of seeds here in Brazil could also be taken to Africa. And it's amazing how this has not happened until today. So the problems um, aren't so much in the investment. Oh no, we need investment in agriculture. No, the problem is doing what needs to be done so that the agricultural production is naturally uh, the focus for investment. Thank you very much. Uh, we discussed before that uh, your bank has a appetite, has a drive uh, to work with Brazil, rather than other countries, right? If you, have, if you have Brazil, other countries, I'm not going to mention these countries, uh, Afraxin Bank and Africa in general, but your, particularly Afraxin Bank will say, why not Brazil? Uh, in agriculture, what is what we still need to have Brazilians to work with Africa to bring results in Africa as we have in Brazil. Okay, great. So to this Two point, minutes, please. Yes, so this point why Brazil, we, we typically as a bank don't only support Africa as a continent, we support Africans all over the world. Brazil having this high percentage of diaspora and, and, and content of displaced African make it a priority country for us. We've seen we're in the Caribbean now, Brazil is a priority. That's why we always get plus point when we see a Brazilian uh, uh, business. What we need to do is actually, we need to do more in how to match the agriculture experience, the agriculture producers, the success story in Brazil into Africa. We can do a lot of this when we can see what are the specialities that can be uh, singled out here and start to do introduction and start to do finance. The other thing is we need to do a lot of value addition to our industries in Africa, and this is where Brazil can help. Let me give a quick example on the hot chocolate and chocolate we eat. The cocoa production in the world, the total profit is 140 billion. What we retain as Africa from this 140, or even the main producer in Brazil, is from two to 10 billion max. It's not even a 10%. The whole profit goes to all of those people to manufacture, package, sell, and everything. Unless we start to add value, like we don't export cotton, but garment and, 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 and so on, it will not happen. My view is, let us do a clear matching of the key Brazilian success stories. Let's find what countries are in need of this, and we start to do this matching. Let's invite them to our industrial zones. Let's invite uh, this knowledge of sharing. We discussed capacity building. This needs to be extended on agriculture, capacity building, and so on. So uh, this, this, it's, it's, we need to do Parma. We did now digital platform to match also people together. I think we need to invest on in this, and then capital and investment will flow. Thank you. I see here that I just have to finish, but I will be an anarchist. I will not r respect the rules now. I have a challenge to my colleagues in the panel. There's a challenge for you to, to, to consider. Uh, in, a minute, 
in one minute. That's the elevator pitch. How can we transform a country looking at the infrastructure with investments available? So the problem is not resources or not only resources. So in one minute, what is the recipe to the development of infrastructure? Otaviano, one minute for you. Appropriate institutions. Aqui se ter em lugar you got to have institutions that provide security to the private investment to participate in infrastructure projects, and this is key, which means to say transparency, accountability, and above all, internally. One minute for you to answer the question, what's the recipe to development of infrastructure? Uh, I know you can have in 30 seconds, but yeah, one minute. I mean, you know I can talk forever, right? But I wouldn't do that. Uh, first and foremost, build local capacity. I think that would de-risk it, but also lower the cost of financing and completing projects. Uh, and the, other, the other one is a macro thing, which is what I call the ease of doing business. In, in general, you know, uh, if you look at the rankings that the World Bank used to publish, which it doesn't anymore, but Africa used to rank, most of Africa used to rank low on the World Bank's IFC's annual ease of doing business because we make it complicated, difficult for, for, for companies to do business. A lot of Africans have improved, but we still need to go some ways. One thing, though, I do want to just add and conclude is I have a concern about the rating agencies, the global rating agencies, how they rate Africa. I think it's distorted which means the cost of borrowing for Africans. I know there's a movement right now to have, for Africa to have its own rating agencies. I'm not sure that's the solution. I think the solution would be to engage Standard & Poor's, Moody's, and Fitch, and engage them in a meaningful way so that the ratings that they give for Africans, especially the sovereign ratings, really are reflective of the state of development of Africa is at as opposed to a cut and paste of what we see of a rating of a U.S. or other things. I think these are just very quick because you only gave me one minute. I have a long list of things, <laughs> but these will be some of my top recommendations. Maybe we can have another forum just to talk about the rating of, uh, of Africa. Natalia, you think what's Natalia, no, you're easy to answer in one minute, so... Okay, first of all, the three biggest problems of humankind would not be solved without Brazil and Africa, which is energy transition, protection of biodiversity and safety, food security. So how can we make this feasible? So first, the government has to make uh, regulatory discussions to have a business environment that is attracting private capital as well as international capital, creating conditions to increase the internal savings. I totally agree with the rating discussions. It's not only for African countries, but for Brazil as well. That's a discussion we got to have to incorporate in ESG and for looking in the selection of ratings, not only backward looking, that's what they currently do, which is very subjective. But in general, I think each government and for each government institutional uh, stability, development bank to uh, fill the gaps and private capital as well. Rating is the next agenda. Okay, Armando, one minute for you to give the answer, the recipe. Okay, first of all, to have resources, knowledge and science, especially in public goods to support reforms that our countries need. Second, good structure of projects. Third, it's necessary to work with local players that they can work as instruments. They have a better perception of the market. They better uh, run the market. All right, good. A quick and quick answer. And you, one minute. Okay. So basically, um, one is try to secure this is this needs long patient capital because it's long term it's infrastructure really countries need to look at how to grow their regional multilateral banks because these are where 
their patient capital will do. And to touching on the rating, our rating issue in, as, as South countries is basically what we have under the ground is not in our balance sheet. So you might have all the oil, everything under the ground, but your balance sheet doesn't show that you have this wealth, and the rating of the South South countries will always be low. The second thing is local talent. I think the whole idea of that we need to import everything that we need for our infrastructure does not help us in the long term. How to build capacity, how to, how, how to get the next bridge to be built by you or by another neighboring South South country, because this will help us reduce the cost as we go uh, in the future. In African Bank, for example, we're starting what we call Africa Energy Bank. I'm, I'm spearheading this. And basically not only for oil, it's for transition also, and also for helping on the infrastructure needed to distribute electricity, to distribute the, what, what is needed in this region. So local talent, local funding that supported internationally, just to summarize, and hopefully rating will kick in after this. Thank you. The chair here in your answer was the, the, the Energy Bank. I think if the bank brings this answer, energy, which is fundamental, good take. Uh, Lessa. Lessa. One minute answer. I think we have already mentioned the three basic things, which are education, legal stability, and financing at adequate, uh, adequate suitable costs. And now we have to see the competitive advantage. and the infrastructure for the development of those uh, competitive advantage from end to end, not rather than focusing some points of the way, because logistics uh, compromises the competitive advantage. On the other hand, you've got to have financial solutions that involve the whole chain from the, uh, the, the small, the big, and the medium involved in this process. So a horizontal treatment of the infrastructure end to end and a vertical treatment of each one of the players that we've been involved in the process. OK, so let's give a round of applause to them, to my team of panelists. When it comes to an event like that, we learn. I learned a lot in those two days, but I learned with the classes, and I really thank you for the way you explained complex things in such a simple way. So once again, thank you very much to all of you, and I hope to see you soon. Thank you very much.